Hebrews chapter 11. We have been going through the book of Hebrews for some time now. We've been in chapter 11 actually for some time. And uh, I will be honest with you, I did not really intentionally, uh, I did not set out with the intention of being in chapter 11 for as long as we've been. Uh, however, I've found uh, that going through some of these biographies in a little bit more depth, uh, it can be helpful, can be useful. We learn a lot from people that have gone on before. And so we're, uh, we're spending time on that. Um, there's, a, there's a number of common commentaries that I, I enjoy on various books, and one of the books, I, commentaries I have for this particular study, uh, uh, the author of that commentary just was extremely brief in any descriptions of any kind in chapter 11, and I get that, because when they read the letter the first time, they didn't have eight weeks of chapter 11, you know, but, uh, but you know, we are the beneficiaries of a lot of biblical history, and we have a lot of, uh, we can spend this time together and do this, but I, I saw that, and I thought, wow, I, I wish there was more, you know, and so I just found myself digging in more. Uh, I don't rely entirely on commentaries, but I just, but I, I love to hear what other authors and speakers have said on these subjects. And yet, he was remarkably brief. And I thought, well, I, we, I want to do more than that. I want us to spend time getting to know the people that are being referred to, because the author here, and ultimately the author is the Holy Spirit, intends for us to look at their lives. Part of the reason that there's brevity in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews is because the Hebrew Christian audience would know these stories already. Already. They would be referred to because they would be poignant to those reading, where they may not be to us so much. As a matter of fact, a couple of folks today uh, that we're going to look at, we're going to look at three in particular, uh, two of the three are likely not very familiar to us, and we'll see that as we go through. Samson is probably well known for a couple of things, but most of the three that we'll look at, most about the three that we'll look at today aren't so much. So what I'd like to do is go ahead and pick up in chapter 11 of Hebrews. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and read verses 32 through 35, uh, the beginning of 35. And we're going to be here this week and next week, and then I think we're going to move on. So uh, we may actually finish the chapter next week, if you can believe that. So verse 32 says, And what more shall I say? That may sound familiar. We started here last week, and we looked at the first name he mentions. But what more shall I say? For the time would uh, fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, uh, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to flight the armies of the aliens, which doesn't mean spacemen, by the way, it just means other nations. Uh, women received their dead raised to life again, with all respect, Eric Von Donneken. Um, so anyway, so... The author here wants to go on and to speak about some people that are examples of faith. And the reason for this is because those who are reading this letter for the first time are wavering in their faith. They're caving. They're in danger of shrinking back to living under the weight of the law rather than pressing on walking with Jesus, experiencing that life of freedom that comes by faith, though that life of freedom is somewhat of a dichotomy for the Christian oftentimes, isn't it? Because as a Christian, God has called us to live by faith, to live in holiness, to walk with Him in ways that we never would have dreamed of prior to knowing Him, because we would have felt it was restrictive. Uh, for any of you that came to the Lord later than as a child, I came to the Lord when I was about 21-ish or so, and when I came to the Lord, it was out of a lifestyle that would not have, I would not have wanted to necessarily be that Christian. You know, I was Christian enough in my mind. And what that meant was, is that I basically lived the life I wanted to live and had Jesus too, kind of a thing. Well, God's called us to more than that, hasn't he? And whereas at a level of immaturity, we would say well, that's restrictive, maturity as a Christian says, I'm not only free in grace to do things, but I'm also free not to do things because of God's grace, because of my relationship with him, because I've come to know him better as I've grown. I'm not just, you know, grace isn't a license for me to do whatever I want. God's grace is a reminder to me that I don't have to fall into those things before that would restrict me from enjoying the fullness of my relationship with God. The first century Hebrew believers were uh, in danger of sort of sacrificing much of that freedom for the sake of safety, for the sake of a level of comfort where they might back away from a little bit of persecution. And the author here is saying, no, there's nothing there in that. That's finished. It's done. It can't provide you 
with any real sense of peace or any real sense of walking with the Lord because you're not. You're choosing to walk instead under a system that was always insufficient to bring you to where God wanted to bring you, except that it was meant to bring you to that point of realizing you needed Him in a way that you could never earn yourself. So when we read these names, they're brought up as examples of faith, of those who, in spite of their, as we've often said, their failings and shortcomings, their flaws and their, their doubts and concerns from time to time, God holds them up as examples of faith because they're ordinary, because they're, they did extraordinary things, but in and of themselves, they were ordinary. We'll look at David next week. David was not even an all-star in his own home. But yet God holds him up as an example of faith because he believed God and God therefore did things in his life. It wasn't always easy and he certainly had his mess ups and we'll talk about that later on. But as we look at these names, they're there so that those in the first century would be encouraged to press on. And they're there for us too, but we don't always know as much about them as those Hebrew believers did, those Hebrew Christians. So we're going to spend a few moments looking at them as we go through. Um, by way of a little bit of history, in the book of Judges where these next three names, Barak, Samson, uh, and Jephthah are, are, are the focus of our attention today. The book of Judges is an extremely depressing book for the most part because most of the book revolves around God having to reach in and deliver his people because of their constant f going into idolatry. I don't want to keep saying falling. We talk about that next week. No one really falls into sin. But they continually do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. They continually go after the gods of the nations. They continually forget about what God has done for them as a people in the past. And the book of Judges opens essentially with the nation coming into the land, Joshua dying, and very shortly thereafter, it says, after Joshua died and that generation with him, after they died, there arose a generation afterward, and as we read through the chapter, we see it was pretty short afterward that they forgot the Lord, they forgotten the things he had done, and they'd begun to walk in uh, following after the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the false gods of Canaan. And so God would consistently give them up to those nations so that those nations would oppress them and then they would cry out to him and he would send ultimately what we see are the judges. Uh, okay, And they would come and they would deliver the people and, and, and there would be peace for a period of time until eventually they would fall once again into this idolatry and sin. Um, there is a point as we move into um, the beginning uh, of our section today looking uh, first off uh, at uh, at, uh, at uh, Barak. But as we lead up to that time, the people have gone into idolatry again, and God is finally telling them, why don't you cry out to these gods that you're going after? You want to be delivered? Cry out to them and see if they come and help you. In other words, stop and think about the silliness of what you're doing in going after gods that are insufficient to save you. This is their condition. And this is the constant cycle that runs throughout the book. Now, many of the tribes of Israel to this point uh, had not pushed out the, the nations of Canaan that were there as they were supposed to. When God brought the people into the promised land, their responsibility was to move forward by faith and push those nations out that were there. The idolatry nations that were guilty of all kinds of heinous kinds of worship of their gods. And then God said, no, this land is not theirs. It's yours. I'm giving it to you. It's ultimately mine, and I'm giving it to you. And so their responsibility was to push out those nations, but they often did not do that. Many of the tribes of Israel did not push out those nations. Uh, if I recall, the first one named is the half-tribe of Manasseh that did not push out the nations that were around them, but rather instead, like some of the other tribes as well, they actually embraced some of the women of those tribes and took them as wives to themselves, thus integrating into their own lives much of the idolatry of the surrounding nations, and thus began their problems of the cycle we began to describe. Well, God would raise up judges time and time again to deliver them. A few of those are mentioned very, very briefly, and I'll just kind of bring us up to Barak. The first judge that is mentioned is a guy named Othniel. He's the younger brother of Caleb. Now, Caleb was a giant. Not really. Actually, he fought off giants. Caleb was a giant of the faith. Uh, he's not mentioned here in Hebrews 11, but he's Joshua's partner as they spy out the land many years before they enter it. And once they do enter it and the land is allotted, Caleb wants to go after the worst place full of giants that there are. And he's an old man at this point. 
That tells you a little something about the character of this man. Well, Caleb's younger brother is a man named Othniel, and he's the first one that God raises up to judge the people of Israel, and by judge it means to, to rule over them. They don't have a king yet, so they have judges, and Othniel is this person, and he ultimately delivers them from the Mesopotamians, who are the first people that they ultimately fall to, and they have rest for about 40 years. However, once again they do evil in the sight of the Lord, and so God raises up a man named Ehud. Ehud begins uh, a number of kind of funny stories in the book of Judges and how God delivers. Uh, the king of Moab is a fat man, uh, and it's pointed out that way in the Bible because Ehud comes at him through a, ma a, a series of intrigues and stabs him in the gut so that the sword goes inside of him pulls his hand out and runs and and, and, and and the king dies and then they find him dead. The Israelites come in and they, they conquer the Moabites and they have freedom in that. After that, about 80 years later, they enjoy some peace. So I should say during that time of 80 years of rest, the Philistines do give them a bit of hard time and a man named Shamgar comes along and he kills 600 Philistines with an ox goad. I bring that up because that just sounds cool. He killed the 600 Philistines with an ox goad. Like a ninja of the old days kind of a thing. He just took on these guys. Well, that brings us up to chapters 4 and 5 where we now see that the king of Canaan, not just the king of some areas of the nations, of some particular region, but he's called the king of Canaan. Now, Canaan is the land that is now that, that we think of as the promised land. It is entirely possible that the author here in Judges is intending for us to get from this that these are going from small skirmishes to ever increasing resistance against the people of Israel, which is important for us to know. Because if you don't vanquish sin in your life and you give it a foothold, it will start small, but it will eventually develop resistance in your life to where it will become a massive hindrance to your capacity to move forward. And at this point now it says the king of Canaan with 900 chariots of iron stood against the people of Israel. 900 chariots of iron, an army of more than 1,000, 900 of whom are riding chariots of iron. This is a formidable force. And this is the stage that is set as we come to the first name that we look at today, and this is a man named Barak. Now, the reason you may not know the name Barak is because you probably know what you would think is the real hero of the story uh, back in Judges 4 and 5, and that's a woman named Deborah. Deborah is a judge in Israel. She judged Israel during this time, and people came to her for counsel during that era of their history. Uh, which, if you understand the patriarchal nature of that culture, this is odd. This is different. This isn't like today, where it's okay and normal and common to see women in leadership roles. This would have been an odd thing. And when uh, Deborah is hearing from the Lord, she hears from the Lord that God wants to push back the king of Canaan. And she calls Barak, whom God has said to send as leader of the army to take them on. So she calls Barak and says, Has not the Lord said that he wants to use you to lead us against the armies of Canaan? And Barak says, If you go with us, then I will go. And typically in that we see, and, and her response to this, I should say, before I make that point, her response to this is to say, okay, I'll go. However, there will be no glory in this for you, but rather deliverance will come at the hand of a woman. Now, it's not even Deborah who brings deliverance. It's, it's a woman named Jael who's really not mentioned anywhere practically in Scripture except here. The way this goes is that uh, Barak goes ahead and he begins to lead the army, Deborah's with him, and he musters 10,000 troops. And they, God gives them a rout. And Barak leads the armies, and God routs uh, the Canaanites to the point where he puts them to flight. And so he starts very shaky. He's doubtful. He's fearful. He's not walking in faith. But he ultimately grows into this role a little bit very quickly, somewhat like Gideon, if you remember last week. He didn't start, mighty man of God, who are you talking to? That can't be me. He's hiding down here, threshing down uh, in the low grounds and that kind of a thing. Well, Barak is of similar character where he's not confident at all. But God ultimately uses him to do this. Well, as he sets them to flight, the leader of the armies of Canaan is a man named Sisera. 
And Cicera, or Cicera, however you might want to pronounce that, I'm sure because we're saying in English we're mispronouncing it anyway. But Cicera leads the armies, but now they're at flight, and so Cicera flees. He jumps off his horse and chariot and he runs on foot. And he comes to the tent of a woman named Jael, whose family uh, is somewhat at peace with some of the regions in Canaan. And so he goes to hide. She invites him in. And I like the way the story goes here. Uh, she invites him in and says, why don't you hide here? And puts him kind of under a rug to sort of cover him up and hide him. And he's thirsty. So he says, give me some water. And I like it. It's, it's a detail that maybe I'm reading into a little bit. But it says she opens up a jug or some of your things will say a skin of milk. Gives him milk and then covers him up. Now, if you're worn out and tired, what does milk do to you? People sometimes get up and have milk to, to drink to go to sleep, right? I almost wonder if she does that for that purpose. Because as he goes under the rug and he's hiding, she takes a tent peg, drives it through the temple of his head into the ground, and kills him. Gross. It's awesome. Just totally just nail, literally nails this guy to the floor and just kills him instantly. And so their ultimate victory did come at the hands of a woman. Why on earth is Barak the hero of the story? Why is, why is it that he's being held up as an example of faith? I mean, the, the women are the ones who stood out in this story, and you can't argue that. They did. They rose up. Well, I think part of the reason we see this is because most of us, like Gideon, like Barak, when God puts something in front of us that is of a challenge to us to do, we don't always run first until we get a little prodding from someone around us who's willing to come alongside and help us. Um, I mentioned last week, there have been times in my life when I have been terrified of what is next. I don't know, Lord, how you're going to get us through this or what the circumstance is. Uh, and and I'm, I'm not so arrogant as to say that, thank God I have those experiences because now I walk by faith. I don't worry about stuff ever anymore. That would be really arrogant because I still have moments, but I will say there are fewer of them. This whole thing with the move of the church, when I first got the email about the move, I was not the giant, mighty man of valor. You know, my first thought was like, oh my gosh, really, Lord? This is hard. I, what do I do? I don't even know where to look, you know? But I, you know, the Lord has reminded me enough times that he's got it. You know, I've mentioned a couple of things that happened between then and now that were a great encouragement. The Lord has this. Well, sometimes we need encouragement to kind of press on. I'm not saying that Barak shouldn't have just stepped up and said, if, if, yeah, if you've heard from the Lord and this is his command for us, I should just jump in. Hopefully we get to that place one day. But there, for many of us, we're not there. For many of us, we do wrestle with faith, taking that step forward as God would call us to. Now, Barak, again, he started, you know, with hesitation now, but he ultimately did get strong, and he finished strong in the end. He and Deborah together sing this song of victory. This, this It's called the Song of Deborah, but the two of them ultimately get together and present this wonderful song of God's deliverance. And so he, again, is a very common, ordinary person. And under most circumstances, if we were, or, or most of us under that circumstance, I should say, would likely have responded similarly. And so I think it's there for that reason. And in particular, those first century believers, though they are doubtful, though they are fearful, they are being encouraged to press on. Now, the next person we read about is a guy named Samson. Um, there are a lot of theories why the names are listed the way they are, because they're not chronological in most cases. Uh, David and Samuel. Samuel came before David. Well, Samson uh, actually comes after the last name we'll read about, which is Jephthah. As a matter of fact, we read about Gideon last week. Samson comes after Gideon in the historical record. Uh, and so there are theories as to why various people are put in various order. Um, one theory in this particular case is because in the same way that ultimately Barak was helped by two women, Samson actually is undermined by two women. Uh, and it may very well have been set up as a teaching tool, uh, which in itself, if you're a geek, this is for the geeks among us, there are arguments about who wrote, not arguments, but there's a lot of debate and discussion about who wrote the book of Hebrews. Uh, Barnabas is one of those names. Luke is one of those names. There's a couple of names that come up. However, this particular insight, if in fact the author used this teaching tool 
of putting these names together for the sake of memorization, for the sake of teaching. It's a very Hebrew approach to teaching, which may be a little hint to the fact that maybe it wasn't a, a Gentile like Luke or somebody. It was probably somebody Hebrew who literally wrote these things. That's just another hint toward the knowledge of such things. I don't want to read too much into it, but again, if you're a nerd like I am, then, then things like that sometimes jump out. So Samson. The story of Samson is an interesting one. Samson is, uh, is a bit of a dichotomy because from the beginning, the Lord, or it says the angel of the Lord, but they recognize that it's the Lord that has met with uh, them. This is Samson's parents, Manoah, uh, his father, and uh, his mother, who I, I don't believe is named, but the two of them, meet, the Lord meets with them. And they, he mentions to them that they're going to have a son named Samson who's going to be deliverer of God's people against the Philistines. So the parents get word of this son who's going to be a deliverer. And they are to have him committed to a Nazarite vow. That's different than a Nazarene. A Nazarite vow is a different thing. But essentially it speaks of consecration to the Lord. Very strong consecration to the Lord. They are not supposed to drink strong drink. Neither should he. When he's born they're not to bring a razor to his hair and all this kind of a thing. There's elements to this that are telling of this vow. And so that's what he is committed to even before he's born. Uh, and so when he is born and he grows into a young man, here he is set aside to be the deliverer of God's people against the Philistines. But what is the first thing we read about Samson is that he grows to a young man and he sees a woman of the Philistines and wants her to be his wife. Now that's a bad start. However, interestingly, it says in the passage in Judges that uh, his parents, though they tried to stop him from making this decision, it says that they did not know that this too was of the Lord. Now, I'm glad the teens are not all in here because we always tell them not to be unequally yoked, that God's desire is not for you to date an unbeliever and all this kind of a thing. This happens to be a place that is a little confounding in that regard because God has actually orchestrated things for Samson to take this on. This is somehow part of the way that God is going to overthrow the Philistines. I'll stop there because I don't really understand why we would do this. But God also asked Hosea to do what? To marry a prostitute, right? God does things sometimes within his own prerogative that are intended to do things. And so this is one of those times. So his parents are resistant. He says, no, she's pleasing to my eye. That's very important. I find her attractive. That's why I want her. Not she's a godly woman. She's wonderful. No, I think she's pretty. And so they finally, they get her for him. And uh, as he's going to meet with her, uh, he and his parents are going off that way. And on, on the way, a lion jumps out at them, whom Samson, with Hulk-like strength, kills this thing with his bare hands. Imagine a lion flying at you, lur lurching at you, lunging at you, and you grabbing it and killing it right there on the spot. As he... Uh, as he they go off, he comes back around, he sees that there's bees and everything around it, the body is decaying, but they've built honeycombs inside of this carcass of this lion. So he grabs some honey and he's eating it. He doesn't tell his parents what has happened, but he's just eating honey as he goes. So as he gets to the Philistine home uh, or area where, this, where his wife lives, he throws a riddle at the Philistines. He says, I've got a riddle for you. And he lays out this riddle based on this idea of having killed this lion, but he doesn't tell them. And so he says, I'll give you a week to figure it out. And if you figure it out, I'll give you, uh, what is it, 30 pieces of clothing. And if you figure it out, or if, I, if you don't, then you got to give me 30 pieces of clothing. So they rack their brains for a few days. And finally, they can't figure it out. They go to Samson's wife, one of their own, and they threaten her. And they say, if you don't tell us what this is, we're going to do you in. So she goes and she puts on the crying act. She's weeping. She's sitting on his lap. She's crying. You don't love me. If you love me, you tell me this riddle. And so he tells her the riddle, the answer. She goes back and tells them. They come back with the answer, and he's furious. So he goes out, and he kills 30 Philistines, takes their clothes, and gives it to these guys. That's how he pays them, pays their debt. So uh, time comes by. Um, she ends up dying. Uh, through, again, you can read the whole thing. I don't want to do the whole thing, but she dies. The next thing he sees is a harlot in, in Philistia, here in, in their land. And 
they want to kill him. And so they go into this harlot after he's been with her, and they say, where is he? We want to kill him and everything. Well, before they ever catch up with him, he goes to the city gates, rips them out of the ground, carries them up to a high hill, and sets them up so they can see him, as if to say, really? You want to take me on? Sends a message. Next, he meets Delilah, and this becomes his downfall. This becomes his undoing. By this point, he has come to see that the Lord has given him victory over the Philistines, and he knows that he's, he's Israel's deliverer against them. However, at this point, it becomes clear that he's become rather arrogant about this. His strength, his, the fact that the Lord is with him, he becomes arrogant. And so he takes Delilah in, and she's definitely in cahoots with her people. So they want to destroy him. So she, they tell her to find out what his weakness is so that they can take him down. So she comes in and she says, you know, you don't love me. If you love me, you tell me your great strength. And why are you so strong? What's the source of it? How can we? And the way she asked the question, you know that Samson's not so stupid as to not get what she's doing. How can we, you know, how can you be bound and not be able to break loose? She asks him that kind of a question. So he's not dumb. He's arrogant. He doesn't think he can be brought down because after all, he's God's man for this job. So he makes up these stories. If you take these, what was it, flax kind of a thing, I'll be weak as any man. And so she binds him up while he's sleeping and, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. And, and he breaks out like it's nothing. And then he wipes out these guys that come after him. So they try again, find out. You never, why won't you tell me? Why won't you tell me how, how I can bind you and everything? You know he's not stupid, they've already tried it. Take, take new ropes that have never been worn. Put him on my hands and legs and I'll be as weak as any man. She does it while he's asleep. Philistines come. Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He breaks them as it says. He broke them like they were threads that had been, uh, that had been lit on fire. Like they were, it was completely effortless for him to break these things off. And he takes on these Philistines and takes them down. Finally, it says that she basically just complained to him until she like grated on his soul. And finally, he told her, I've taken the vow of a Nazarite. I, I've never had a razor taken to my head. If you cut my hair off, then I'll be just like any other man. I don't know that he really thought that anything would change, or if he was so arrogant that he thought that no matter what you do, I'm going to always be the victor in these things. But she shaves his head, and it says that he did not know that the Lord had departed from him. And so the Philistines came, they took him down, they gouged out his eyes, and they put him in prison as a servant. And so some time went by as he was blind, working in the, uh, uh, I think he was pushing a millstone around kind of a thing. He was just, he was in prison. Until one day the Philistines decided to have a party and they wanted to bring Samson out as an example of their great might. They took down the mighty Samson. So they wanted him to come up and perform for them. Blind man, pathetic, weak. And so he comes up blind, he's led by a servant, and he tells the servant, just set me up between the two main pillars here just so I can rest on them. And he, so they do, and he can't, as they're laughing at him and as they're having sport at his expense, he calls out to the Lord and says, Lord, just this one time, give me strength. And God gives him strength. He sets the pillars apart so that the structure collapses down, and he kills more Philistines in his death than he ever did in his life. What an odd story. What a very strange account of a very strange individual. Or is he? You know? Uh, maybe this speaks a lot to people in ministry, but I, I would imagine there's application for any one of us. But there is a danger that we can fall into when we walk with the Lord for any period of time where we no longer rely on the Lord but we rely on our own strength. Now, as a person in ministry, um, I've not been in ministry for 100 years, but I've been in ministry for over 20, which is not as long as many, but it's long enough to learn uh, a couple of things and to make enough mistakes to hopefully learn some lessons. But when we begin to believe that because God has called us or because he's put us in a position that pretty much anything we say or do must be of the Lord, 
There's a fall coming when we cease to rely on him, to seek him. What did Samson do at the end? He cried out to the Lord, I don't have what it takes, but if you will grant me this one more time, I'll serve you with it. It took, it took him coming to the point of his death, eyes gouged out, beaten, weak, humiliated, to finally realize the error of his ways. Or in that time in prison, but he finally got to express the fact that he learned. Um, God help us to ever feel like we've arrived at a place where our daily need to walk with him and to lean upon him ever changes. It never does. You will never, you and I will never walk with the Lord enough to ever be self-sufficient, to ever be strong enough to rely on our own. God does invite us to step out. He invites us to take the step. He invites us to get involved in the work. He invites us to try things that are beyond our ability and all that. So we do participate in the things that he does, but they're the things that he does. We're always in partnership. We're never solo. We're never enabled to, we're never enabled to do things on our own. It's just that we think we are. We may not call it a Nazarite vow. We may not even be in ministry in some official sense. But we can all come to a place where we no longer lean on him, but in our own strength we take on the enemy. We take on the task. For the first century Hebrew believers, this is a great reminder for them. They're making a choice to go into a lifestyle that will rely upon their ability to be obedient to God's law. Samson could not do things in his own strength. He thought he could until the Spirit of the Lord departed from him, and then he realized, I wasn't doing this in my strength. This was all the Lord all along. Well, the Hebrew believers in the first century were in danger of going back to a system that was intended to demonstrate for them how incapable they were, but yet they were choosing to go back. Samson seems like a confusing story, and it seems odd to put it in this place, because he doesn't seem like a man of faith. He seems like a man who made some tragic errors in his judgment. However, in the end, he was reminded of that which was most important, just as they needed to be. You need to rely on the Lord. Don't go in the strength of your own abilities. You don't have any. Move forward with the Lord. And what happened? God, the Spirit of God came upon Samson, and he was strengthened to do what was necessary. What is the author saying to these people? You need the Spirit of the Lord to move forward. You cannot, in the strength of your own abilities, expect to have, to experience what God wants you to experience. It's a good reminder to them, and of course it is to us as well. So Samson's an interesting story. Powerful victories, but in his own arrogance and under the enticements of a woman, he ultimately fell. Of course, uh, in terms of the enticements of a woman, Billy Graham always used to say, of course, he had these, uh, and probably still does, he's still alive, although he doesn't really go around anymore, but he, he had this, uh, he always kept before his mind the warning against uh, uh, gold, glory, and girls. Those are the three things you got to watch out for as a minister. You know, glory, hey, this is not about you. Gold, finances, riches, don't be tempted by that. And women, guys, no, especially ministers and stuff. Of course, for women, the contrary would be true, but there's not a cool 3M thing. So, all right, there probably is, right? Money, men, and whatever. So, but anyway, so there's a lot of lessons in the life of Samson. Well, now we come to this third one. A man named Jephthah. Now, again, Jephthah's time comes before Samson's, right before Samson's time. But he is put here at the end. And again, it may have been for a teaching purpose in that. But Jephthah is somebody that if you, if you were to think of heroes of the faith, great names in the Bible, people that you think, this is what I want to be like or someone I can learn from, probably nobody stops and says, oh, Jephthah, that guy, Jephthah. Most, I mean, most people don't really think of who that even is. If you didn't read about him in Hebrews... And you don't spend a lot of time in the Old Testament, you'd never even know who he was. But he's an interesting person. Jephthah is someone we read about in Judges 11 and 12. Uh, and again, as, uh, as we come up to his time, is after the time of Samson, and in that span of time, uh, the people again come into idolatry, they're following the false gods, they're doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord, and God says, why don't you call out to those gods? See if they'll help you great thing. If you feel like you want to rely on your own strength or you want to go after something in life that you think will deliver the ultimate, when you realize it doesn't, remember to come back to him. Now, when he called the people to go call out to the gods that they wanted to serve and see if they would help, he said, I won't deliver you anymore. As if to sort of say, look, you guys need to come to a point of decision here. This is getting ridiculous. 
Nevertheless, Jephthah happens to be along at that time. Jephthah's a Gileadite, which is to say that he's from the area in Manasseh. Most likely, that's what's generally presumed. Uh, Gilead is his father, and uh, however, Jephthah is an illegitimate son. He's born of a harlot. He's not born of Jephthah's wife. And so, as, as Gilead and, uh, and his wife have other children, eventually when they grow older, they dispossess Jephthah, saying, you'll never have any part of the inheritance in this family because you're not one of us. You were born of a harlot. And so he's forced to wander. And it says that worthless men bound themselves to him, and they went out raiding together. So the, Jephthah's an interesting hero. He's somebody who is brought up under, under no fault of his own. He's born under terrible circumstances, uh, and he's ultimately disowned by his family, and he's forced to have to fend for himself with seemly folks, seedy kinds of crowds and that sort of thing. Until one day, the enemies of God's people come. Uh, ultimately, um, uh, they can't stop them, the Ammonites, and so uh, they send for Jephthah, because Jephthah is a strong He's a strong man, and they, they would need his leadership. Well, Jephthah's been cast out, but they come to him and say, will you lead us against the Ammonites? And he says, look, why, why would you come to me? You kicked me out. You've, you've disowned me. Why, why all of a sudden now do you come? And they said, well, and they don't really give a good answer. They just sort of skirt around it a little bit and say, well, you know, we need you, essentially. And so he says, well, if I do this thing and I lead you against the armies of Ammon, well, will you make me your leader? Will you make me essentially your judge? Will I, will I be your head? And they were at mitzvah when they made the commitment saying, may God judge between us if we don't make you our head if you bring us this victory. Uh, mitzvah is an interesting place. You might remember, uh, if you've ever had one of those little pieces of jewelry, you know, may the Lord watch over us until we, you know, kind of a thing. It's, and you give like a half of it to your BFF, and you've got one half, and it's like, may the Lord watch over us while we're apart. And it's a very cute, nice, endearing little thing. That's not what mitzvah was in the Old Testament. Mitzvah in the Old Testament was a place where Laban and Jacob, who didn't like each other at all at this point, made a covenant and said, may God do to you all the these things if you mess me over again. If I ever see you again, you know, it's not cute, it's not BFFs, this is like not even frenemies. This is like just get out of here. I don't want to see you again kind of a thing. Well, this is where they are. They say, well, may God judge us like this if we don't uphold our hand to the end of the bargain. Yes, you will be our head if you lead us to victory here in this place. And may God judge us if we don't make it so. And so he says, okay. So he musters up the armies, he gets them together, and he sends, a, he sends word to the king of Ammon. And he said, tells them to back down. He says, look, I'm, I'm in a position here where I'm, we're going to go to war with you. Back down. Stand down now. And he says, no, we won't stand down because you people took our land. The king of Ammon says that the Israelites took our land. And then Jephthah, who's born of a harlot, disowned by his people, running raids with a group of bandits and everything, gives a history lesson to the king of Ammon. He is well-versed in the history of God's people. And he goes back to the story of their exodus from Egypt and how they went around one area and the Ammonites, among others, would not let them pass through their land and everything. And so God dispossessed them for their uh, mistreating of his people. And Jephthah puts it out there and says, look, the Lord has dispossessed you because of the way you treated us before, and he's going to do it again if you don't stand down now. And the king of Ammon paid no attention. And so Jephthah routed him, took him down, defeated the king of Ammon, and the Israelites were spared. And so he became the judge. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord came upon him, and he became the judge of God's people. Now, Jephthah then, to, to round out the story, he was so excited over what the Lord had done, uh, or was doing, that he said, as, as they began to rout the enemy, he said, if you give me victory today, I will, I will dedicate as a burnt offering the first thing that comes out of my house. That was a really dumb thing to say. As he comes back after the victory, his daughter, his firstborn daughter, comes out of the house to greet him. And he's horrified. I don't know what possessed him to say that. Just It was just the, the moment of excitement. He just made a really rash vow. 
And he says, my daughter, you've taken the life from me. You just, why would you, why would you come out of the house? And so he's torn, and she ultimately says, do whatever it is that the Lord, what you've promised to the Lord, honor your vow to him and all this. She's extremely magnanimous about this. Now, the question comes up, did he actually kill her and offer as a burnt offering or not? The way the rest of the account goes with her, it talks about how she wanted to go off to be with friends to wail her, bewail her virginity. She was a young woman who'd never been with a man. Um, but it never explicitly says that he killed her. So there's a lot of debate as to whether or not this happened or whether he just dedicated her to the Lord and she remained a virgin the rest of her life. I tend to view that because I don't really see how that honors the Lord in any way to kill your daughter and burn her. But, um, but there's debate about that. It's a very rash vow, a very uh, unfortunate and unwise thing to do. Um, There is, there is a capacity on our part uh, in the excitement of the moment walking with the Lord to be very unwise. I don't want to build a lot on this, but, but there's an obvious lesson there for us. Um, when it comes to our service to the Lord and our walking with Him and to see Him work in ways that are profoundly moving, It is, it's wise to take those things in, to meditate on them, to consider them, to pray about them, and not to knee-jerk react to the moment and make rash statements and rash vows. That's what Jephthah did. Um, however, I only point out that part of the story. That, in the Hebrews, they don't talk about that part. I bring that up just to point out once again how ordinary the people in this list really are. Um, even when we get to David and Samuel, they're still ordinary people used in extraordinary ways. Jephthah, who's really not known much in Scripture at all, except in those two places, Judges and Hebrews, um, when we see his story, we're once again reminded of, we can once again kind of see ourselves in that. I can do things like that. I can make bad decisions, bad statements. But Jephthah's held up as a model of faith, and that's the bigger point we want to point out. Jephthah was somebody who was an outcast, somebody who was rejected by his own family, something that would resonate with these Hebrew believers in the first century who often also were ostracized from their families. When Jephthah agreed to serve his people once again, uh, he demanded that he be seen as among their number and even their leader again. Uh, it is entirely possible that so many of these first century Hebrew believers, after having been ostracized by their families, kicked out by society, seen as those who were in a cult and deserved to be kicked out of society, once it became known that they in fact were walking with the Lord after all, it was going to become important for them to find entrance back into those relationships, to have a witness and a testimony, uh, to see God work as the Spirit of the Lord was in them. So we look at someone like Jephthah and we see an example of somebody who was kicked out and forced to sort of wander, but ultimately was embraced back in, and God did great things through them. Um, for those who uh, find themselves on the outskirts of their sphere of influence, family, workplace, friends, classmates, whatever it might be, because of your walk with God, uh, the answer to you is not to feel as though that's forever, because the possibility may come along where you may find yourself at the very center of their life once again, and become an important person in their life to bear testimony to God's goodness, His grace, and His power. Um, Jeff is an encouragement to those first century believers who are living on the outskirts of all that they knew because of their faith. You know, uh, there's a cost that came with God's decision to save them, uh, much as came with God's decision to put Jephthah in that circumstance as he entered the world. Um, so there is something to be learned from them as an example. Now, when we go next week, as we move into the rest of that verse and then through the rest of the chapter, we now come back to a couple of names that are extremely well known. David. Uh, we look at Samuel. And there's, as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, um, the first part of this list, the first half of this walk through the hall of faith, deals with those that God has conquered through and brought victory through, through God has done great things through. And then in verse 35, we'll move 
move into a, a real changing of the tide. Suddenly now we're looking at those who have suffered greatly, persecuted, died uh, for their faith. And we need to look at that and see what it is that the Holy Spirit is intending to encourage these first century believers who are afraid of that very thing. Mentioning that to them wouldn't seem as encouraging a thing, but there's something for us to learn in this. So as we continue through this, I'll always, as, as always, invite you to read ahead. But I just want to close this by just pointing out that in spite of their unfaithfulness, in spite of their fears, their failings, even their upbringings, their experiences in life, God was able to work in the lives of these people that we read about today. And in the first century church, those Hebrew Christians, uh, did not think of themselves as someone God could use, but rather they saw themselves as those who needed to run and hide. Don't ever let yourself come to that place. Don't ever stop and think for a moment that the better idea is to fall back into the easy life of seeming little commitment. The goal is to press on, to continue to move forward, to continue to come deeper into your relationship with God, not to walk back on it. The truth is, and this sounds so cliche to say because every Christian blog in the world wants to scare us to death with this, but the truth of the matter is there will come time as we move forward toward the return of Christ when it will become harder and harder to be a Christian in this society. It will be harder to live out of faith out loud for fear of being rejected, ostracized, kicked out. You're not carrying the status quo. You're not living according to the norm. Uh, most of what the world sees of the church, uh, they don't typically want to line up with because it's convicting, because it's, it's, it's an offense. It's like salt in an open wound. But our call is not to back off and make it easier to just sort of get by in that world. Our call is to press on with even more of a sense of fervency and passion and intention. Because one day the job will be done. One day our last day of work will be here and we'll go to be with the Lord. And there will be no more of this opportunity. Now's the time to do that. Um, it's not just a word for the first century believers. It's a word for us as well. So having said that, um, I want to bring this to a close. Uh, those Hebrew believers were being reminded of people who were in God's hands. They had come to believe in Jesus, the one who is their Messiah, the one who said that all of those who the Father has given me, I will lose none of them. None can take them out of my hand or my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Are they less secure and safe in God's hands now that they're following Jesus than they would have been before? Of course not. So the encouragement is to understand that you are finding rest and safety in His arms. And that's the only place that you can find that. So God, help us to press into that as well. Father, we thank you for the knowledge you give us in your word. As we look at the lives of those who went before, help us to understand the value of walking by faith, praying on a regular basis to be filled to overflowing with the Holy Spirit, that we might not cower away or shrink back, but that we might move forward and walk with you with such intention and such passion and capacity to see you work and such desire to see you work that it never crosses our mind to shrink away. Father, we uh, sometimes find ourselves in a similar mind frame as those first century Hebrew Christians. Help us, Lord, to take to heart the lessons that you wanted them to learn for the same reasons. And Father, we thank you for all those who've gone before, those who paved the way, the cloud of witnesses that we can look to, those who would urge us on, as it were, and encourage us to press on. Lord, help us to do so. Father, for those who don't know you, for those who've never made a commitment to Christ and are simply living right now under the weight of their own sin and their own, and their own desire to try and work out a way to deal with that sin. Father, I thank you for the clarity with which you speak. There is no possible way to deal with our sin except for Jesus, who came into the world to take our sins upon his shoulders and to die for them at the cross, rising from the dead to new life, just as he promises we will if we put our trust in him. Thank you, Lord, for your son. And we just pray, Lord, for those who have never made a commitment to him, that here in this day, in this moment, your Holy Spirit would be speaking to their hearts and helping them realize that today is the day that they need to do business with you. And if that is you, then I want to invite you to pray with me right now. Heavenly Father, I admit that I'm a sinner. I have offended you in more ways than I can count. 
But I do believe that Jesus died for my sins once and for all, to lift that burden from my shoulders and to set me free from its weight. I thank you for the grace that you have brought me because of his sacrifice for me. I thank you that he rose from the dead to show me that there is life everlasting. And I look forward to that now. Give me the strength to leave my old life behind and to walk with you all of my days. Thank you for your love for me, your grace, and your mercy. In Jesus' name.